Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Anthony Peak. Um, I was going to say Consciousness Hour, but uh, well, it is actually Consciousness Hour, so I have actually got it. I'm so confused already. Um, I've been looking forward to this discussion um, today for a long, long time, and uh, myself and my guest John Ineson have just been discussing, just talking now for the last fifteen minutes. And I wish we'd recorded some of the things because we have such similar taste in music. But already, I'm telling you, some of the the anecdotes and experiences are just going to really, hopefully, really amuse you. Now, one, what's the background to this? Well, many, many years ago, I think it was um, late 1969. Um, myself and my friends, a couple of my friends, we managed to bunk in to um, see an X movie, uh, which was playing in our local cinema in Birkenhead uh, on Merseyside. And the movie was um, Easy Rider. And it was kind of a really trendy. We'd heard about how trendy this all was. And of course, we all wanted to go around on chopper bikes and everything else. And funnily enough, a few years ago, I did manage to go to the bridge, which see, which filmed with the sequence of the bridge in that particular movie in Arizona. So it was really wonderful. I recognised the bridge as we went past it. And I, thought, I know that. I know that bridge. <laughs> but anyway, the movie was really good and I really enjoyed it and everything else. But there was one particular track that really stunned me. And it was uh, a, sound, a song called I Wasn't Born to Follow uh, by a, an American band called The Birds. Now, I'd heard of The Birds and I knew of them, but, you know, I was only, what, 14 at the time, 15. So it, it wasn't it didn't particularly register with me that much. But that song really stunned me. So I started checking up on The Birds and I found that here was this musical style that kind of came almost from the kind of Mersey beat jangly guitars of The Beatles and The Searchers. But they'd taken it to another level. And then I checked out some more of the Birds albums and I came across tracks like uh, Eight Miles High. Was it Eight Miles High? It was Eight Miles High. It was Eight. Um, uh, from their double album, Untitled. And I suddenly found there was this genre of music I really identified with. And that genre of music became known as country rock. But it's a wonderful amalgam of so many different styles of music. And a few months ago, I came across a book called Desperados, written by John Ineson, who is um, a, a Canadian journalist come, come music writer um, living in, um, in Winnipeg in Canada. And his book was wonderful. And it gave me so many stories. And it, it, suddenly I was spinning off checking out bands I hadn't realized existed. So suddenly I've enhanced my musical collection massively just by John's wonderful book. And I started reading his other books and I realized that we have so much in common in terms of musical taste. And I've just discovered after our quick discussion now, even more so. So already, folks, we've already agreed that John will be coming back for a two hour session where we're going to get more into this, the whole thing of our interest in musical taste. But without further ado, John, welcome to Anthony Peake's Consciousness Hour. Thank you, Tony. Nice to be here. Absolutely. Now, some of the things we were just been talking about before, I really just want to zoom in on because they're such wonderful pearls. I was explaining to John that. Um, um, I remember Christmas 1970 buying the Led Zeppelin album, Led Zeppelin 3, when it first came out and listening to particularly when you listen to that album, the first track on it is Immigrant Song. And it's the one that really takes you by the lapels and you go, wow, this is extraordinary. And a year later, I was explaining to John, I managed to see um, Led Zeppelin um, in Liverpool at Mountford Hall, and I was in the front row. And in fact, um, what happened was they were preparing to do um, Stairway to Heaven, because it was obviously one of the tracks they were working on at the time. And I remember grabbing Robert Plant's foot. I was that close. <laughs> and he pulled himself back. And I thought, this is a really great anecdote. And I thought, there's no way that um, John could beat that, but John can. Bow, come in then. <laughs> well, yeah, I uh, in 1970, I was 17 years old in August of 70, and there was a big uh, music event called Man Pop, and Led Zeppelin were uh, the headliners, along with Iron Butterfly. And uh, my band, Euphoria, was the opening act on the show. We opened the show uh, for Iron Butterfly and uh, Led Zeppelin. And when we do the two hour show, I'll, I'll, I'll bring the picture of me from there, you know, 17 years old, hair down to here. <laughs> and I remember standing, turning my amp on, they announced the name of the bet and turning around and there's 14,000 people. And I go, and, and that's the moment that they snapped the picture of me with my Telecaster, looking stunned at the time. But 
you touched Robert Plant, and that's that's pretty cool. My only, my connection to him again comes a little later on. I'd, I'd written a book on Gene Clark called Mr. Tambourine Man: The Life and Legacy of the Birds, Gene Clark. And uh, he was a huge Gene Clark fan. And in fact, on the, al the album he did with Alison Krauss, um, they, did, they did two Gene Clark songs. They did indeed. But was it and, Burning, Burning Sand? Uh, yeah. Oh, Raising Sand. Raising, Raising Sand, Sand. That's right. Yeah. And, and he was also a huge Arthur Lee fan. And in fact, when Arthur was sick, Arthur Lee of love, when Arthur was you know, sick with leukemia, Robert Plant on his own dime flew over to America along with Ian Hunter and they did a, a fundraising show in New York for, for Arthur. So I got an email from Robert's management person and saying Robert would like copies of your books. So I signed them to Robert Plant and sent them off. I had, haven't heard if he ever read them or not, but I never touched his foot. So you got me beat on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, sure he, I'm sure he wasn't terribly happy about it at the time, but I had actually, we, we, we'd, wait, we'd been in the queue all night to get the tickets. So, you know, it was just, you're just in awe. And of course the noise level and the sound was extraordinary, but uh, it was- but, You know, they, they, I was going to mention about, because you mentioned, uh, sorry to cut in, about Im oh, uh, song. Um, you know, they weren't, because it rained, the, the thing got kind of moved indoors on a makeshift stage and all that, but they had a, they had a clause in the contract that said, if it rains, because it's an outdoor event, we don't have to play and we still get paid. But there was a local singer named Diane Hetherington who went and banged on their hotel room door where they were all congregating with Peter Grant, and she 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 gave them hell. And she said, you know, you guys owe it to the people. There's you know, ten thousand people in the rain soak, and so they came they came out and played. I mean, they set up a, a makeshift PA system using the guess who's Garnet amplifiers as speakers, and um, and they came. They started at two o'clock and played. But what, what two in the morning? But what was amazing was they opened with immigrant song that none of us had heard before. Mm. Uh, and it just, I mean, it was mind blowing. They just written it in, in June when they were played in Iceland. And at that point, I don't even think they'd recorded it yet, uh, but they were opening their shows that summer with immigrant song. And it, it will always be in my mind hearing that song and seeing them on. on this, uh, so that, that's the why the stage. That's why the, 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 you know, the, the imagery I've come from the land of the ice yep. and snow. So yep. that's, the Midnight Sun, and so that's clearly. And I was wondering, was that the famous tour that Led Zeppelin got involved in the Vancouver incident with the uh, the prostitutes in the hotel with, <laughs> with the shark or something? I don't know that one. <laughs> well, we were, as far as I know, there were no prostitutes at the at the International Inn in Winnipeg. <laughs> but you know, I had uh, a few years ago, uh, I was invited to to I, I do the speeches about the you know, history of Winnipeg music and powerpoints and all that sort of thing. I'm kind of a song and dance man, and um, it was for the Icelandic consulate and the Icelandic ambassador who was come from Iceland to, to come to Winnipeg. There's lots of Icelanders in Winnipeg. I'm Icelandic. Uh -huh. And so I, I explained the history behind that song, immigrant song. And then on acoustic guitar, I slowed it down and I sang and played it. So people could actually hear the words to it. Whereas, you know, it's kind of hard sometimes to figure out what, what Robert's singing. And I come from the land of the ice and snow, all that sort of thing. So you, you're quite I'm right. I mean, the lyrics are quite wonderful, that song. And I, it would be very interesting to hear a slowed down version of it, because I'm sure everybody just gets into the vibe of it without realizing what he's saying. Yeah. yeah. And that exactly. was always the thing about Zeppelin, wasn't it? I mean, lyrically, they were always very interesting, you know, weird songs. Well, uh, once That's they got to the lot. third album and then into the fourth album, the first two albums, the lyrics are so, you know, so learn my language, cock lemon. rock kind of music. <laughs> yeah, the lemon song. <laughs> The yeah, lemon well, song. I mean, how did they get away with that one? I just, I just don't know really. But obviously, there was, um, there was obviously an image there. But, but going back then and rolling backwards. Um, so what got you into country rock specifically? Because obviously, you started more as a hard rocker. Obviously, we are interested in bands like Backman Turner, Overdrive, and the Guess Who. Clearly, you know, much heavier. And of course, Iron Butterfly and Inagada Davida. And what a <laughs> weird album that was. Wasn't the story that it was the lead singer couldn't say in the Garden of Eden or something. Yes, that's and right. Well, he's sort of saying, oh, you know, kind of mumbling it stoned, I guess. And was, you know, they, they came on, you know, no one knew if Zeppelin was going to follow them or not at that point, but they did the whole song, you know, 25 minutes with the, you know, the interminable drum solo in it. <laughs> yeah. well. um, you know, my, my roots in music go back to 1965 and, you know, seeing the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show in February of 64, I mean, I wanted a guitar. And so my, you know, the, the minute my parents put a guitar in my hand, just after Christmas of 65, just changed my life forever. Um, and uh, the music that ca caught me, first of all, was actually blues. 
the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, the Blues Project, got me into into tracing Chicago blues and and buying albums by BB King and Buddy Guy and Otis uh, Rush and all those kind of people. So I, I actually played blues initially uh, as a guitar player, but um, into, into pop music. But what got me into country was actually. I, I hated psychedelic music. I, that whole summer of 67 stuff, you know, with, with, with what Chris Hillman once said, the lyrics were bad high school yearbook poetry. <laughs> that <he> described <laughs> the lyrics of the psychedelic music. Yeah, and these me meandering guitar solos. Um, and then I heard the Buffalo Springfield doing Go and Say Goodbye, which is very country, uh, and uh, Charles Claim to Fame. And then, you know, after that doing Kind Woman. And they were they were touching on country in a rock context. And then Time Between, which came out in, um, geez, would that come out in 66, I think it was, uh, or 67 uh, by the Birds and Chris Hillman with, with uh, Clarence White playing guitar on it. And that, that just connected with me. And it brought me back to when I was a, a toddler at home, even before I, I started school, my mom would have the radio on in the kitchen all the time. My father was a railway engineer. And so often we had to, you know, keep quiet the rest of the house because he was sleeping all night. And as he worked nights. And and the music that I heard in the radio was largely country music. It's, you know, this is in, in the in the early to mid 50s. And um it 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 didn't, I mean back in those days you didn't categorize music. It, you, you might hear a you might hear um, a country song by Ernest Tubb, followed by a Frank Sinatra song, followed by an Al Hurt trumpet jazz song, that sort of thing. But the country stuff stuck with me. And um, when I began to hear country tinges, country tones in, in the rock context, it really appealed to that in me about the, the, the honesty and authenticity and storytelling element of, of country music that Psychedelic music just did not have it. It was just so soulless and vapid. So it, it kind of piqued my interest to kind of get into that. And being a big Buffalo Springfield fan, uh, they they kind of led me, they and the birds, into, um, you know, in 68, buying the Dillard and Clark album, you know, Fantastic Expedition of Dillard and Clark. And then the first Poco album in early 69 and connecting with all of it. But I think overriding all of that was, uh, I just fell in love with pedal steel guitar. Yeah. And I just loved pedal. I still do. I'll go see anybody if they got a pedal steel yeah. guitar player in the band. Uh, I love pedal steel guitar. And, and, and I liked hearing it being used in kind of a rock context. Um, like with Poco, the Burrito Brothers, all of that sort of thing. So um, my trip into country rock began by following some of these rock bands in, in, the, um, in the mid to later 60s. And then you know, carrying on through, uh, through all of... Uh, all of that, but I certainly credit uh, the Buffalo Springfield and the Birds with with kicking it all off for me, and and certainly with the Birds, it's Chris Hillman. Mm. I, I would say of of all the people in my record collection that occurs more times than anybody else is Chris Hillman. That and David Lindley, um, who sadly passed away, didn't he last week? Yes. Yeah. Um, and you know, I'm a great fan of. I've always been a great fan of Jackson Brown and and his his wonderful lyrics and everything else as well. And to me, it, I think, again, it was it was it was steel guitar that, that got me into it. I remember there used to be a guy called B.J. Cole. who Yes, I know. Was, I just wrote about him last week because he it was really? the anniversary of his birth or his death or something. I, I have a, a, a Facebook site called John Anderson Remembers. And I do music history every day. And mm -hmm. I, I had a post about B.J. B.J. Cole. Yeah, he was a one. And, you know, he was he had this wonderful playing style. Um, and I think I saw him live. I think he was with a band called Cochise. Yes. I which that. played out. They played our school. They played my school, Cochise. And of course, in those days, I couldn't differentiate between standard rock and, and country rock because I didn't know the subtle difference. And then I remember getting heavily into um, a band called Starry Eyed and Laughing. Mm -hmm. um, who were a wonderful English band that really failed. And I, I met that band a few years ago, I don't know, many years ago now, actually. It was Tony Poole, I think, was the main guy. And I met them after they did a concert. And I mentioned that I bought their first album and their second album. And he turned around to me, he called the rest of the band over and he said, we found the guy. It was him. <laughs> 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 and I, I have found, and they've just brought out a new album now. They can't call themselves Starry Eyed and Laughing, but they brought out a new album in the last week or two. 
Tony Poole and his associates. So it'd be very interesting to check that. But it was, it was kind of a style of music that just, as you said, it spoke to you in some way, you know, and it was ordinary people's lives. And although I'd gone through the music, I'd liked Yes and I liked Genesis and everybody else as well. But I found them ever so slightly pretentious, whereas the the Roots bands were just talking about real life, you know. And there's that wonderful song, isn't there? Have you heard the one, um, If You Play a Country Song Backwards? Do you know that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. your, your, you truck, your, your truck back starts, back and back. Your, girl, your wife comes back and your dog doesn't die or something. <laughs> and it's, it's wonderful, but it, it, it kind of takes the pastiche of it. But I always felt that country rock just, you know, and then they had Bringley Schwartz. You know, and I think B.J. Cole played for Brinsley Schwartz as well. And then, of course, the English bands that came up that were teaching us, the bands that we think are folk bands, people like Furport Convention. Of course, Ian Matthews, you know, did the def- some of the definitive country rock albums. Yeah, and he covered Gene Clark. He covered a lot of other uh, country rock artists on, on his albums. I loved him. I thought he was just fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. I bought everything, even obscure stuff I could get back, you know, in the 70s and 80s. I bought uh, Ian Matthews. I know. And I loved I love Plain Song. Yes. In, Sur- in Search of Amelia Earhart. I oh, yes. I love with that album. I wore out one copy. I bought two more. One I still have sealed in case the other one gets worn out. I, I, must got the try, I must try and get Ian Matthews on this program, actually, because um, we are in contact. He's living out in the Netherlands now. And he's still touring and he's still and everything else. And I'm, maybe I'll message him, see if we can get him on. Maybe you and I could talk to him about it. Wonderful. You know, because, you know, because the early Furport Convention, everybody says Furport Convention were, you know, folk rock, but they weren't. They were country rock, you know, and they moved into. And of course, there's this overlap, isn't there, between folk and country anyway, you know. And this... Well, yeah. And, and a lot of the a lot of the guys in, the, in my focus in my writing has been largely on the California country rock scene. And a lot of those guys came out of the folk scene and out of, you know, what Bernie Ledden called the folk scare or the folk boom, you know, that began with the Kingston Trio in 58 and carried through until, you know, the Reed Beatles and the British Invasion and all that, um, you know, the folk boom of that time. And they grew up on that music. And it's interesting to note how many of them cite, the, for example, the Kingston Trio mm-hmm. as being a big influence on them. And even on the second Buffalo Springfield album on the back, they list, you know, each of the guys kind of lists their, their in, you know, the people that influenced them in, in, in some way. And right there is the Kingston Trio who had a big impact on them. Also, you know, Randy, ba- Randy Backman is also listed on there, really? too. Really? So Randy in- Backman of Backman Turner Overdrive, and You Ain't yeah. Seen Nothing Yet, was yeah. an influence on... Oh, on- well, Neil, Neil Young. Neil Young used to go follow him everywhere in Winnipeg really? to go see him play. You know, when, when Neil Young was nobody and Backman was a somebody playing in what was called Sh- uh, Chad Allen and the Expressions, and who they became the Guess Who. But, and Neil has always been very open about that. I was on a documentary about Backman a couple of years ago, film for it, and so was Neil. And he said, Neil Young was my big, or he said, Randy Backman was my biggest influence back then. Really? How interesting. And, and who influenced Randy and Neil was Hank Marvin from The Shadows. They, they, they loved him. And, <clears throat> excuse me, about 15 years ago, the Shadows were doing, maybe 10 years ago or somewhere, they were doing some kind of a reunion show and they weren't going to be playing together anymore, some kind of a tour. And Randy and Neil got tickets to go see them at the Hammersmith Odeon, which I think is called the Apollo now. Mm. And they went to go meet uh, the Shadows backstage and they were just like teenage girls meeting Justin Bieber. They were so excited. And, and, and Hank gave his salmon colored Fender Stratocaster, you know, the story goes, it's the first Fender Stratocaster ever in the UK. It, to hand it to Randy and said, here, do you want to play this? And Randy was like, uh, you know, what, what am I going to play? This is what I love about your writing and your books is you have so many anecdotes and stories. You seem to really know. And because you know many of the characters personally, you have this this wonderful position because we were talking beforehand and you mentioned we were talking about Paul McCartney and you, you told me a wonderful story about Paul. McC- I know we're get, going off tangent, but, you know, I, I found That's a okay. fellow enthusiast. So, you know, just mentioned. Well, what, what stimulated that was your your anecdote about Paul McCartney not knowing who you were. And so, no. well, I, Paul McCartney knows who I am, but not for the right reasons. Uh, they he and, and came to perform. I, he's just billed as Paul McCartney now. He came to perform in Winnipeg uh, about five years ago in a big outdoor show, you know, 50,000 people. And the, the local newspaper always gets me, to, if it's some music history related thing, they get me to write, you know, a little bit of background. So I did. 
But in the, in the article, I referred to Paul McCartney as uh, a nostalgia act. I said, there's nobody going to that show tonight or tomorrow um, who was waiting to hear anything new from Paul McCartney. They want to hear the old stuff. Some of the stuff going back, you know, to the Beatles and, and, and you know, 50 years ago. And uh, the promoter was a friend of mine. And I didn't go to the show. But um, actually, I was, fly I, I was flying to Liverpool that that day oh, right. to lead a tour i do these i used to do these tours uh anyway so so he told me afterwards he said when he arrived paul mccartney had the newspaper open to my article and he was pointing at my name saying who is this guy you know I, you shouldn't be saying that i'm not understanding you know, he was pissed off at me <laughs> well just quickly so it gives the opportunity just to tell my story of paul mccartney doesn't know me and what happened was many years ago i was i was working as um, uh, a management consultant and i was working for the thompson organization um, in London, which is a Canadian company originally. Yeah. I was quite surprised when I first went to Toronto, Toronto, I should say Toronto, and I went up the, the tower there and the, the Thompson organization sponsored the bit at the top, which I thought was quite weird. But anyway, well, one, of the, one of the big venues in, in Toronto was Thompson Hall, Roy Thompson Hall. All right. Big concert venue. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, it's all right. And Thompson, without, without a P, we were always told you don't put the P in Thompson. There's no P in Thompson. I'm sure there's a joke there somewhere, but I can't, I can't think of it off the top of my head. But anyway, what happened was that um, I was doing some work with a lady called Trisha McIntosh. Um, and um, we got talking one day and I, I mentioned that I was originally from the Merseyside area. And I said, and funnily enough, I, I went to school with... Um, with uh, a guy called Ted Robbins. And I was in the drama society at school with Ted Robbins, who became a, a vaguely famous British comedian. He was on a lot of TV programs many years ago and his two sisters still are. Um, but um, it was interesting because she then turned around and she said, oh, this is interesting because she said, my brother, Danny McIntosh, plays plays for plays in wings he plays as a session musician in wings uh, or plays as a musician in wings and she said the interesting thing is that whenever wings play in london paul and linda and the band come round and they have a big fry up at my mom's council flat in north london and i said oh that's interesting and i didn't think anything else of it anyway she rings me back about a month later and she said oh paul and linda and the band were round at my my mum's house last night and we got talking about people we knew and she said i mentioned i knew you and that you had gone to school with ted robbins paul's cousin and apparently paul mccartney sat there and went tony peak tony peak i don't think i know him so for a moment, I was in the mind of a legend, you know, for a split second, I, fl I flitted through his neurons and I probably got lost in his synaptic gap, you know. But yeah, I'm, I'm the synaptic gap in Paul McCartney's world. Probably well, I'm, I'm a thorn. I'm a thorn in his side is what I am. So we've got something. Absolutely. I'm his synaptic gap and you're his thorn. I'm sure we could actually build on this in many, many ways. But going back again, moving on. Um, quickly because we're going to go on for hours here but the one of the things that um i noticed in the background that you have the the csn album oh, um yes. which um i've actually got as well you know because it's for completion's sake because it has a lot of out tracks and yes. things from other albums and before we started we got talking about the great david crosby and of course we lost david crosby recently um but apparently that you have a copy of that that's signed you tell me I do. Uh, when I was doing my Gene Clark book, Gene Clark, for those who don't know, was the tambourine player and the, really the principal songwriter in the early birds. And um, of course, I wanted to talk with Hillman and McGuinn and Crosby, who were the, the three, you know, still alive from from those days. And uh, for Crosby, he said, you know, when I emailed him, he said, well, I'm going to be playing in Sioux Falls, South Dakota you know, in, in this particular date, why don't you come down? I'll leave a you know, backstage pass there at, the, at the, the door and come in and we'll, we'll do an interview there. So when the date came, I went down there to, uh, to do an interview with him and um, sat in this, the, each, each of the three guys had separate dressing rooms and separate tour buses. Wow. So they only, they only mingled on stage. Otherwise they kind of went their own way. <clears throat> so I, I met, I met up with Crosby and, and, spent almost two hours with him in his separate dressing room. And, um, you know, it's funny. McGuinn said this when I, I, I told this story, I'm going to tell you. Uh, McGuinn said, you know, death makes people reflective. And what happened was, I, I, mean, I was there to talk to, to Crosby about Gene Clark. And it's fairly well documented that Crosby was a real jerk to Gene Clark. I mean, Crosby was, you know, 
private school kid and, you know, privilege. His dad was an Academy Award winning cinematographer. Um, and Gene Clark, you know, finished high school and that was it. Came from a family of, you know, 13 kids. They lived in a, you know, a, a two bedroom house in the middle of a park. Um, so David picked on Gene Clark. You know, and and you know, thought he was a thought he was a hick, you know, just a dummy. And uh, David managed like initially, uh, the rhythm guitar role was Gene Clark's, but Crosby managed to convince Gene that that Crosby was a better guitar player than Gene. So he talked Gene out of that role. And Gene became a tambourine player, but he was he humiliated Gene a lot and and talked down to him a lot. And in bringing that up to Crosby as we sat and interviewed. He got all teary eyed. He got, you know, tear, tear, wiping tears away. And he admitted, he said, you know, I'm, I don't know if I can use this phrase on your show, but he said, I was a real asshole to Gene Clark and, and, and I feel bad about it. Again, it's the idea of when someone passes, you become ref reflective. Mm -hmm. But um, I meant, so I, <laughs> that's one of my claims to fame. I made David Crosby cry. I also <laughs> made John Kay of Steppenwolf cry too, but that's another story. Wow. Because I did a book, I did a book with John Kay. Um, so when we were leaving, well, that's well, that's totally born to be wild, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, when we were leaving the dressing room, um, just before we did, I I don't usually get uh, the people I interview to to sign an autograph. I, I, I've seen how that changes the dynamic of a relationship. If I show up to sit down and talk to David Crosby with an armful of Birds albums and CSN albums, all of a sudden I'm a fan. I'm not the interviewer anymore. And it, it changes the professional relationship and the way they would deal with me. So I, I don't do that. And, um, but I figured I'm not gonna see David Crosby. This is a big deal. And his first biography in a long time gone was such a big influence on me that I brought the book and I brought the poster. I thought, wow, what the hell? And he signed the book, you know, which you know, thrilled about. Uh, and he signed the poster. And we came out of the dressing room and Graham Nash was there. And so uh, I said to Nash, would you mind signing this? And Crosby said who I was, and he signed it. But Stephen Stills wasn't around. So I figured, okay, two out of three. I'll, I'll, I'll live with two out of three. And then three months later, Crosby, Stills and Nash came to play in, in my hometown of Winnipeg. And Crosby sent a note with, you know, come by backstage pass and tickets and you know, come see me afterwards. And so we went afterwards backstage and Stills had already gone on his bus and he was about to leave. And uh, I had the poster and Crosby, Crosby said to a roadie, called him over and said, here, get Stephen to sign this phone, you know, before he leaves. And so the roadie went and he came back and a couple of minutes later said, Stephen says he's not signing anything. So Crosby looked at the roadie and says, you tell Stephen Stills that this is for a personal friend of mine. And off he goes and he comes back and it's signed. And, you know, I, I didn't want to take the chance that maybe a roadie signed it. I, you know, when I got home, I, I went online looking for Stephen Stills' signature, and it was authentic. It was the real thing. So then I got it uh, mounted and framed, uh, along with a few other things in my uh, in my little office here. So if you could have get a hold of Neil Young then as well, you'd have got the full set, wouldn't you, I suppose? <laughs> I've, got, I've got lots of stuff signed by Neil Young. I mean, I've sat in his living room with him, mm -hmm. uh, you know, interviewing him. And whenever Neil Young comes to Winnipeg, and I don't know if he's going to be coming again, but... And he comes to Winnipeg, he always sends me, you know, my wife and I tickets, the best seats in the house and backstage passes. Wow. And so we hang out with him. We've hung out with him on his tour bus, uh, backstage with him at concerts, chatting. And a few years ago, I, being a guitar player, I, um, I bought a White Falcon. It's a Gretsch White Falcon, which is the big white guitar that Neil plays often. And Stills also plays a White Falcon as well. It's yeah. a top of the line Gretsch bottle. And I, five grand, and I, I bought one. But the last time Neil was here, which was two years ago, I took the pick guard off and I took it backstage with him and I got him to sign it. So I have a white falcon signed by Neil Young. <laughs> I would have loved to have him sign the guitar, but I didn't want to bring it to the show. So I signed it. Well, because it's funny, isn't it, with Crosby, Sills, Nash, with Nash and Young, you know, when you you hear the the onstage banter, particularly, you know, the wonderful onstage banter on Four Way Street. You know, don't pay mumbledy peg with you, but you'll steal your leg, yeah. you know, kind of thing. <laughs> and I just love that. And the bit where they, they're about to harmonise and they both, uh, Crosby and Nash, start on the same note. <laughs> they said, I couldn't believe those guys could do that. So you think that they have this wonderful dynamic, but clearly 
that's not no. the case, you know. That... Yeah, well, by by this point, and this was in, God, the 1990s, by this point, oh. um, they, there was a lot of water under the bridge and, you know, off and on kind of uh, kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I sat, I've interviewed Neil a few times. I sat in his living room uh, interviewing for a biography I did on him called uh, Neil Young, Don't Be Denied uh, the Canadian Years. Because no one's ever really talked about the five years or so that he got started his career and formed his first bands in Winnipeg and made his first recordings in Winnipeg. Song, first songs he wrote were, were here in Winnipeg. Before and, he headed, uh, really headed down in the yeah, hearse. Yeah. You yeah. know, a song like Don't Be Denied, you know, we moved to Winnipeg, I checked into school, you know, formed a band and all that sort of thing. And when I called him to ask him if, if he would you know, give me some time, I figured on the phone, to, to talk about the Winnipeg years, I said, how come no one's ever written about that before? And he said, well, no one's ever asked me. So that kind of set us up. And he invited me down on his dime, yeah, believe it or not. And I was supposed to stay on the ranch at the guest house, Broken Arrow Ranch. But at the last minute, he'd, he'd uh, flown Linda Ronstad and Nicolette Larson in to do. Oh, Nicolette Larson. Beautiful he, Nicolette Larson. Wow. He was recording uh, Harvest Moon and he brought them in to do some singing. Last minute, I guess they were both available. So he put them in the guest house and put me in a beautiful suite at a, a, a hotel in San Mateo. But, you know, I said to him afterwards, I said, hey, I would have bunked in with Linda and Nicolette. <laughs> of course, that, what, what a difficult thing that would have been. Wasn't there somebody once said that um, there are two types of men? There are men who fancy um, Linda Ronstadt and people who are not in interested in life or something. It was a very, very clever because I recently saw a documentary on her, you know, and she was just so cute. But then again, so was Nicolette Larson, wasn't she? I mean, yes. you were, what, what a lucky guy. I mean, wow. <laughs> what? <laughs> Damn. You know, the last, time, the last time Neil was here in Winnipeg, as I, I started off saying, uh, and we were backstage, you know, I took him aside and I said to him, because I, I wasn't sure he was going to be traveling anymore or touring. And he had his new wife with him and he introduced me to his new wife, uh, Daryl Hannah. And, and uh, I took him aside and I said, you know, I want to thank you for all, you know, all the wonderful things you've done for me. You know, I mean, the tickets, the backstage passes and, 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 and being a friend. And he just looked at me and smiled and said, we take care of our friends. And, mm -hmm. you know, that, 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 that meant so much to me. And I, and I don't pester him. I mean, he's contacted me when he was putting the archives first box set together. And he sent me a lovely gift uh, for doing that. And when he was writing um, his first autobiography, Raising Heavy Peace, I think it's called, um, Waging Heavy Peace, he contacted me for information, that sort of thing. And I'm happy to do that. But I get people, you know, I swear to God, it's like three times a month, someone say, oh, we're having a fundraiser. We're having a garage sale. We'd like Neil to come by. Huh? <laughs> He's not going to do that. That is the difficulty, isn't it? with you with the people you know and you as you say and it's very interesting isn't it gauging the, the relationship and you're not a fan you are you are a chronicler of of their lives and and what they do and you know the, the, there are a number of things that you know there's so many questions I'm interested in asking you about that those kind of relationships I mean for instance I've never understood why uh the Neil Young movie Russ Never Sleeps and he has all those little creatures like <laughs> from Star coming on the stage and bleeping away, you know, which is uh, the road, the road eyes. Is that what they, they call the road eyes? The road oh, eyes. Right. So there because <laughs> you just see their eyes with them. Yeah. Because anybody, if anybody's watching here, you know, really check out that Russ Never Sleeps because the, 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 the music is so raw, isn't it? You know, and his guitar playing is so incredibly powerful in that you know it, it's extraordinary but moving back to David Crosby um one of the things that I've always I was so sad because I always wanted to meet David Crosby just to ask him about the background to his song Deja Vu as to why he wrote that have you any idea about I no, it's not something within the kind of the purview of of the parameters of what I was interviewing him for. I would I would love to know that too because it's one of my favorite songs, and I love that. It, I mean, I remember buying the album probably mid to late nineteen seventy, and mm. you know that's the first track. And you put the needle on. Yeah. You remember that, folks? Needles and vinyl. Put the needle on, and you know you hear the little voices. It's setting the rhythm up for it, and then it starts with this really fast kind of jazzy thing. And then it then it breaks completely into into a slower tempo song. Uh, I thought it was brilliant, and and still to this day, it's it, it's my favorite track on that album. Yes, I'm a Neil Young fan, you know, and obviously, 
uh, you know, Helpless is on that album, but the song Deja Vu was brilliant. I would love, if, well, you can't now, he's gone. I would love yeah, to know too. Sad, I, I would love album. to know, and it's also Wooden Ships has also always intrigued me as a song, you know, as to what, you know, I've been eating these purple berries, I've been eating them for six or seven weeks, Mark, and I haven't got sick once, and just the, um, the, the, the interplay between the two voices when the two characters are talking, you know, is really good. And the sad thing, when I was at university, um, I recorded... Um, I, I, I recorded a, a cassette tape version of that and clearly one of the tracks wasn't recording very well so I only ever got one side of that conversation <laughs> <laughs> so I, I never knew what the other guy said when he said I've been eating these berries for six or seven weeks now so um, <laughs> I have no idea I do know now but I didn't at the time so it was a great well, you know it's post-apocalyptic right yeah that's yeah, yeah. okay good, good. and that the, and the, that creepy line silver people on the shoreline you know, and you think, whoa, this is this is this is an extraordinarily clever song. But again, just sort of lyrically, you know, it, uh, Crosby is because, of course, I, I mentioned to you in a message that my ringtone on my phone is um, we have all been here before on a loop. Because I think that works so well, the idea we've been here before and it repeats yeah. over and over again. And, you know, it's it, it, I, I loved uh, that album uh uh deja vu i just thought it was just incredible it worked on so many ways and one of the things that always intrigued me was the similarities between country girl and how the country girl song and a buffalo springfield song i can't remember which one it is now but it's a very similar broken arrow broken arrow yes broken yeah, arrow yeah. which was yeah, on a pastiche a pastiche of a lot of different different themes that actually Neil kind of, he and Jimmy Messina kind of pieced that together, Broken Arrow. Yeah. And, and in fact, there's a couple of tunes within the Country Girl Suite that were Buffalo Springfield songs. Ah, like so- Whiskey so Boot Hill being in there and Down, 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 some of the lyrics from that, that he, he stuck into the, the Country Girl Suite. I remember reading Stephen Stills being pissed off with that song because he said, oh, it's just Neil trying to get more credits by, you know, by saying it's A, B and C parts to it. <laughs> yeah, because I, I had that Broken Arrow song on a sampler album called Ages of Atlantic, mm -hmm. which came out in the UK. And I didn't know who Buffalo Springfield at the time was. And in fact, I was introduced to Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young album by a girlfriend of mine whose elder sister had the album. And it was when it, that was playing and Country Curl came on. And I thought, that's like that track by Buffalo yeah. Springfield. Yeah. Um, and clearly, you know, very, very clever way of pulling things together there as well, which I, I think Neil Young. And of course, we've mentioned Crosby, Stills, Nash. We haven't mentioned Nash yet and we haven't mentioned Stephen Stills. But I would say that probably an album I go back to time and time again, because I love it so much, is, is Manassas. Yeah, the first one, right? The first one, the double album. Yeah, the double album, because the yeah, second down one, the road, second down one the road, didn't work for me in quite the it same. It didn't work way. for anybody. It was uh, it, it was a commercial failure. Uh, and right. it's interesting uh, when I interviewed Al Perkins, uh, the pedal steel player mm -hmm. in in Manassas. He said we we recorded that album, you know, down the road twice. And the first version, we sent the tracks to Atlantic Records, whoever, and they said this is rubbish. I mean, we're not going to put this up. Go back and record something else. So they recorded you know, almost an entirely new album. And that became down the road and it was still rubbishy. It just, I mean, when you consider how incredible that first Manassas album oh. was. And it was, it was, I mean, I've always said Stephen Stills' peak period is 66, first Buffalo Springfield album, it really is first recordings. Um, and uh, the first Manassas album, which is like 72. I mean, everything he did during that time, the two solo albums he did, the Crosby, Stills and Nash first and, and with Young on the second album and the three Buffalo Springfield albums, He's consistent. After that, it's it's spotty. And you know, listening yeah. to his, some of his solo albums and also the, the Crosby, Stills and Nash albums, like the one with the wieners on a stick on the moon, that sort of thing. Oh, it, he, yeah. He's got and he's that, got, an American American dream. That, oh, that, that, oh, I can't stand that album. Well, you know, Neil Neil told me that he the only reason he did that album was he promised Crosby when Crosby went in jail that if he cleaned himself up, he would do an album with Crosby, Stills and Nash and Young. So when Crosby came out and he was clean, he he had to follow through on his promise, and he did the album. But yeah, it, it's it's a terrible album. And and you know, the, one of the things I liked about that that box set that that we've been talking about, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and, and Young, is it it brings out the best stuff that Stills did over that you know later period of time without having to listen to some of the lousy tunes that he did during that time too. Mm. Uh, so it, it it highlights the strengths of Stephen Stills uh, in, in that later period. 
But I, I think he was just unstoppable from 66 to 72. Oh, totally. I mean, for instance, you mentioned, is it um, Al Bloomfield or... Um, Al Brookins. Uh, yeah, no, where, the, where Stephen Stills did that super session mm -hmm. album with Bloomfield and... and Al Cooper. Yeah, Al yeah. Cooper, you know, and I mean, that was very interesting in its own way. And you could see the kind of Stephen Stills guitar style. But for me, again, we were discussing earlier on, to me, one of the most incredible extended tracks that I know when it breaks in the middle and it changes is the treasure take one. Yeah. And wow, you know, guys, if you want to listen to a song that it takes you along with it and then suddenly changes in the middle to a completely different song, because of course we, because in that four sides, each, each of the sides, you know, had the Latin beats that Stephen Stills always liked in the, you know, the, the Mexican sound. And then that wonderful side that was very country rock, you know, and, that Colorado song and everything about that album is perfect. And do you think it's a double album and there's not yeah. one duff track on it? Yep, not that's one. right. And and then you wonder, well, how is it that the second album, how, how did he kind of lose the page? Yeah. From the first album to the second. And, and, you know, there's been some, I've, I've seen something recorded in the Netherlands. It's Manassas Live, you know, after the first album. <laughs> They're playing the songs off the album. And it's absolutely brilliant, you know. Um, Byron Berline had told me that he was invited to join Manassas because when that first album was being recorded in uh, Miami, Criterion Studios, the Flying Burrito Brothers were, were really doing what would become their last tour and would, the album Last of the Red Hot Burritos was being recorded during that time. And stills on weekend or on weekdays, because they would play weekends at burritos on the East Coast of the United States. And on, on uh, the weekdays they weren't playing, he would fly uh, Hillman and Perkins and um, Byron Berline and Rick Roberts down there to help with the Manassas album. And uh, he he even at one point said to the guys from the burritos, look, have you got some gigs coming up? They said, yeah, you know, here, there are a couple of colleges or whatever. He said, I'll pay you guys what you would have made on those those gigs to stay here and cancel the gigs. That's how much he, he really wanted that bluegrass feel to that what became that yeah. that side of the of the four sides of uh, that album. But uh, Byron Berlin said he just couldn't do it because he said there was so much cocaine surrounding the recording of that album. He said it, he said this, and sometimes the guys were just kind of nuts from from just doing too much drugs. He, and, and they gave stills, of course, the run of the studio so he could record 24 hours a day, you know, seven days a week. So he, he, he was up and vibrating from all the coke. And Byron said, I just, I just couldn't be around that. And Al Perkins confirmed that because Al Perkins is, um, he's straight, straight as an arrow. Yeah, he's, he's, he's very Christian religious. Well. He's a Christian, yeah. yeah. And Because he and, converted Rick Fur uh, Richie Fury, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Richie and Richie and I said to him, how in the world could you be around all of that? And he said, yeah. I just I just ignored it. He said, you know, I just I didn't take part in it. I knew it was there for the music. So I wasn't there for the recreation for it at all. But I, I'm, I just think that the drugs eventually took their toll on Stephen Stills uh, yeah. after that. After That's very sad, that. isn't it? You know, and, you know, and the name you mentioned there, Rick Roberts, I mean, a band that I, I really, I've got everything they've ever done is Firefall. You yeah, know, yeah, I Firefall. thought, what a great band they were, um, you know, and the, the music they did. They have this kind of wonderful almost uh, well they call it yacht rock don't they is, is the yeah, idea yeah. but in california yacht rock <laughs> and, it, and i think they they were ultimate and another band i really liked that period were orleans as well you know john hall and the music they were doing yeah. so we, we've discussed then stephen stills and everything else as well. oh by the way as a question as, as an expert on this story, it's a question i've always wanted to ask was the band called manassas or was it just because the station they're standing on was manassas junction and therefore we associate the band name with Manassas. I mean, would Stephen still say that band was called Manassas? Yes. Stephen still says it had, I guess maybe he still does. He had a real interest in Civil War history. You know, like out of that comes Find the Cost of Freedom Buried in the Ground. He's writing about the Civil War. Yeah, yeah. And um, so at Manassas, the Battle of Manassas is, is more commonly known as the Battle of Bull Run. Uh, you may have heard of the Battle of yes, Bull Run. Yes, And uh, Stephen had a f fascination with that. And... So the band was named before they took the picture at the train station. Ah, right. Good. That's a wonderful piece of information. That's one of those kind of bits of information I've always wanted to know from somebody who actually knows. Um, <laughs> and, and then we move on. So we've start, we've done the great Stephen Stills. And, th and then we move on to, to Graham Nash. 
you know, um, and Graham's contribution, I think, has always been understated because, again, yeah. one of my favorite albums is his album Wild Tales. Mm hmm. You know, that I think he was massively underrated is he was just the the harmony with David Crosby, because, you know, the famous story where they harmonized in yeah. whoever's house it was, Joni Mitchell's or whoever. And you feel, no, he wrote some extraordinary stuff. Um, and again, I think one of I think of all my Crosby, Stills and Nash variation albums, I think the Crosby Nash album where they, they did Immigration Man. Yes. Yes. It's a wonderful album you know um extraordinarily good and it shows the richness of this kind of musical genre doesn't it it really well, does i mean nash is uh, nash he's known for his harmony singing he's less known for his songwriting mm. and, and that's sad because he does he does be he is regarded as the lightweight of the three even though he's more prolific than Crosby was, you know, you look at the albums and there's more stuff by Nash than, than Crosby. And that's not, not to say that Crosby didn't write, but uh, Nash was more prolific. It's just that Sweet Judy Blue Eyes, Guinevere. Yeah. Um, you know, pre-road downs, you know, which I've, I always thought was kind of the weak, weakest album and a weakest song in the album. And then the song that I just loathe, Our House. Yeah, I yeah, I must God, admit, I mean I get, it's so sweet. I get cavities yeah. and pimples listening yeah. to it. And it kind of it kind of gave him the tag as as the lightweight poppy kind of guy. And and you know, Marrakesh Express too, which you know, which was originally written for the Hollies and they wouldn't do it. So uh -huh. it's got that pop feel when you compare it to Sweet Judy Blue Eyes and and, and Guinevere and Long Time Gone and uh, wooden ships and then yeah. here comes maverick ships. again all those songs they just they shivers up the spine you know and the the um helplessly hoping the alliteration the wonderful yeah. alliteration of it's that cool. song it's sheer poetry isn't it you know it's wonderful and helplessly and, yeah. hoping is harlequin hovers nearby yeah, awaiting yeah. a word i mean that is shakespeare you know to me um that and and that stills i think again at his at his best is that from that period of time coming coming out of that and and writing all that stuff really in uh, in the period uh, between the folding of uh, buffalo springfield in early 68 until you know they they start recording in early 69 for crosby Stills and nash album stills was writing all this stuff and 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 even making demos i've heard some demos with him and and, and crosby just the two of them before nash was even in the picture doing this music i mean he was just so inspired and and so creative uh, and you know i've, I've interviewed people because from the buffalo springfield book i interviewed people uh, like narit wild who who knew um who knew stills in the early days and they said out of all the guys in the buffalo springfield he was the one hungriest for acclaim not, not so much the money but hungriest for stardom and acclaim and he was very heartbroken when he didn't make the monkeys you know, yes, I know. Monkeys, with a little known story, that isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And and he's always given interviews saying, "Well, you know, I didn't want to, do, you know, they didn't want to do my songs, but so I'm on fine with that." No, Narit, who was friends with Tork and friends with Stills and others, uh, she says he was heartbroken, and he carried that with him for a, a long time that he didn't get into the monkeys. But she said, "Don't let him, don't let him, you know, tell you that uh, it's all about the fact that he was a songwriter and they already had songs." Um, it was because he had bad teeth and his hair was already receding. Yeah. And they didn't want to have to pay to fix his teeth and to deal with his hair. I mean, maybe he could be, could have been the monkey wearing the toque all the time. But it was those two things that, that because the monkeys were created not as a, a real bad at the time, they were guys who were going to look good on TV and have yeah. team appeal. And he, he didn't have that, but his buddy Peter Tork did. But that's going to be an interesting, interesting sort of alternate history, a kind of Philip K. Dickian alternate history idea that imagine the scenario that he'd have joined the monkeys and him and Michael Nesmith would have worked together. Because, of course, Nesmith, you know, with with his his work in country rock as well, that could have been a very interesting dynamic. The two of them working together, you know, um, quite intriguing, really, an alternate history scenario. Um, I did. I did something like that online about six months ago I did an alternate history whereby what if David Crosby hadn't been kicked out of the birds 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, we wouldn't have had uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash. Uh, we wouldn't have had Graham Parsons because Graham Parsons was brought in to, uh, to replace, replace Crosby. Crosby, yeah. And and you know and 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 then all the ripple effect that comes out of if Graham Parsons you know never joined uh, the Birds, it wouldn't have been the Brio brothers, and, yeah. and, and 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 no one would have found Amy Lou Harris. Yeah. And really, and on and on and on, all you know the huge impact. And I also did one too about um, a couple of years ago. What what would happen if in on April the 6th, 1966, when Neil and Bruce Palmer are in their hearse going one way on Sunset Boulevard and Stills and Stills Richard Gray and Barry Freeman went the other way. And if they had looked, if, if, if I mean, I interviewed all of the people from that uh, and they all gave a slightly different version of it, but what if they hadn't seen the hearse? Yeah. Then we wouldn't have had Buffalo Springfield. And then you think about what came out of Buffalo Springfield we might not have had. You know, okay, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Pope, but even Logan, Logan's and Messina. You know, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, all of that. You know, it, it's I, I do find that because in my own writing, I play with a lot of these kind of ideas of history and time and how time plays with it. And one of the one of my again my favorite stories, and you're going to love this one. Um, the, it was my twenty twentieth birthday, and it was April the twelfth, nineteen seventy four. Okay. And I go down, I was at university and I go down to buy the, the newspapers and there's the Daily Mirror and it's there. And the headline on the Daily Mirror said April the 12th, 1954, the day that rocked the world. And I'm looking around thinking my friends have sort of spoofed this up somehow. And I'm looking at this. I'm going, what the hell? And apparently it was the day that Rock Around the Clock was recorded. So I'm literally, literally to the day. The, the the child of rock and roll, um, which wow. <laughs> kind of amused me that. And of course, the other <laughs> April the 12th, April the 12th, 1861, when the American Civil War started, oh. um, Fort Sumter and everything. Because I, I again, I don't know if you remember, there was a, a cards that came out in the mid 1960s called the American Civil War cards. Yes. I, I As a kid, I, I well, I don't know. I, I mean, I had them probably. Mars attacks and then them. Yeah, and 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 you know you collected them all, and yeah, they smell you know, that smell of the gum. The gum. Is, <laughs> I can still smell that smell of the gum on the cards, and I collected all of those, and I became really fascinated by the American Civil War because they were so gory, weren't they? Yeah, you know? well, the co- yeah. I mean, I remember the one of the wheel running over a guy's arm. Oh, <laughs> the worst one. The worst one was called Painful Death, where oh, a guy had been thrown. Oh, was off that the wall. spikes? Spikes when he was on yes. the spikes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what we need to do is to work together on writing a book on nostalgia for people <laughs> of our generation going up at that time, because these things were so powerful. Like, you know, the, the Mars Attacks, when they did that movie version of Mars Attacks, you know, but we grew up with the cards themselves before they banned them. You know, yeah. and the one, the cards everybody wanted then was, um, oh, oh, what was it? Not that. Oh. It was where a guy had been burned. The the aliens, the 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 Martians had burned him alive or something. I can't remember what it was now. But everybody wanted that card, you know. <laughs> but it. We see know, in Canada. In Canada, we all collected hockey cards. Oh yes, yes, of course. Yeah, that was a big deal. And and baseball cards. I remember having so many baseball cards, uh, and then you grow out of it and you know they're sitting around in a box. And a few years later, mum's cleaning up the basement. You've already moved. Out she throws them, them away. Them all out. Yeah, I had I used I had I had Rolling Stone magazines from the start, from the first issue on and and you know I moved away from home and whatever my mom's cleaning up and yeah. you know, all the stuff gets chucked. Happened to me. I I had a load of melody makers that somebody had given me from the late 1960s onwards. All the reviews of the Led Zeppelin albums and everything else. And again, my mother threw them all away. And she, she said, well, they were just magazines. And mum, they were not magazines. So I never allowed that to happen to me now. So I've got a full collection downstairs till I stop collecting it of Q magazine. You know, the Q, the English Q magazine. I, I've got I, have a big, I have a big stack. There's a cupboard right over here. And in it is a big stack of Q and a big stack of Mojo yeah. and a big stack of tr- like trouser press. I bought trouser press uh, and Gorilla Beat in these magazines uh, in the 70s, all, all in there. Uh, and my wife, again, she's saying, you know, when you die, I don't yeah. want to deal with this. And your kids and grandkids don't want to deal with this. I know and it's got, tragedy, you know, isn't it? 2,000 vinyl albums in there. And she's saying, hey, the kids don't want this stuff. And they don't want to have to deal with it. Sell it now. And you can give, you can see, you know, that, you know, I, that particular album, you know, Nashville Teens, Tobacco Road, still sealed, 1964. Wow. 
it can go to a home where someone really wants it, you know, rather yeah. than just because I find movie. that with some of the albums I've got, and the one that um is my pride of place. And it's virtually, I don't know how many copies are available of this. It's an album called The Hoax's Midnight Daydream. Oh, I don't know that one. Oh, and what happened was, and a friend, a friend of mine was, his father owned a record shop. And what happened was um, they, they were deciding whether they were going to build, bring out a Cat Stevens live album or a Cat Stevens greatest hits. And they sent out white label albums to, to various selected um, outlets to ask the, the people what they liked. And they went out with the the greatest hits album but the but i managed to get hold my friend gave me a white copy of the hoax's midnight daydream so there's a live version there of things like the boy with the moon and stars on his head and various other things as well you know and that i would if i'd lost that i think i'd be so upset because i've no idea of the value of that but i've never ever sell it because it's just a unique <laughs> piece but when we die you know our yeah, wives exactly. and our children will just think well, what the hell was this you know not like our mothers and throw yeah. them away you know yeah. They don't know yeah. the value. They don't recognize or know the value, nor do they want to bother finding out the value because it's just dad's old crap. And yeah. it's just taken away somewhere. It's like it's my guitars. The- I got five really expensive, rare guitars, two Gretchers, uh, and a and a 50, 50 year old Les Paul. And wow. I might as well sell them while I can, you know, enjoy seeing someone who wants them get them because That's I, a good get, point, I, I always figured I, I have five grandkids. I always figured I got five guitars, five grandkids. I'll leave the guitars to them and they can pick one they want. And then my son told me, he said, well, that's kind of not fair because you've got this Les Paul that's worth, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. You've got a couple of Gretches, but you've got a Taylor acoustic, which is probably worth only 2000. So who's going to get stuck with that? Well, probably the youngest grandchild will get that one where the oldest grandchild will take the Les Paul right away. And then what are they going to do with them? Well, they could form a band and be the Canadian yeah. Osmonds, you know, yeah, there or, we go. or again, somebody else that I really wanted to talk about as well, which we'll probably talk about longer is one, one of my associates, one of my friends, one of my readers in America um, is a really good friend of, um, oh, Pete Rowan. Okay. Of the Rowans. Mm-hmm. Um, and C-train. Of course, love C-Train. Yeah, I C-train. only yeah. got into C-Train because I was supposed to be interviewing Pete Rowan on this program, um, which we're going to try and plan to do later this year. And I was going into his back catalogue because I really loved the Rowan's band, you know, their first mm-hmm. album. I really love that one. Um, and then I recently acquired one of the other ones he did and I got into his music. And he's so interesting, you know, he's it's so many fascinating, areas. fascinating, eclectic kind of a career. Oh, wow. Wow. And he's a practicing Buddhist. So he, he writes songs about Buddhism and I didn't know that. very, very interesting man. But apparently he's very difficult to nail down because he's very mercurial. <laughs> so it's trying to get him on the show or trying to get in advance because he'll go off and do something else, which I quite understand. Why do you want to be interviewed by Anthony Peake when you can go off and do a concert <laughs> down, down somewhere else? Right. Well, we've run out of time. Uh, that was extraordinary. All I can say it was a lot of fun. It was, a it was lot absolutely of fun. wonderful fun. And I think we've just scratched the surface on. I hope everybody listening here has not gone, oh, God, those, those two bloody old guys whibbing on about bloody music that nobody cares about. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope it makes you go I had, out. I had a blast. I had a blast. I, I mean, we could go on all the rest of the day here. Well, we're going to. What we'll do is we'll get the two hour show um, and we'll just go. We'll just go with the flow, you know, just sure. go with ideas, go with the flow, go with music that we like. You know, there's so many bands I haven't even touched upon. I wanted to talk to you about. But everybody go out and check John's books. They are extraordinary. And he covers so many bands in so many areas, you know, that, you know, sort of Graham Parsons, the Flying Burrito Brothers. And you get the background to where these guys started up and how they interfaced with each other. And it really helps you build, you know, that years ago, that rock family trees thing. You've done it. I, 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 yeah, and I did one I, for the Desperados book was supposed to have one in there. So I did it. Oh, really? And it's all, you know, and it, it's just so complex because the Dillards are in there and the Scottsville yeah. Squirrel Barkers and everything. And the publisher said, this is way too complex and complicated to put in the book. I'll send it to you, okay? Yeah, you please, <laughs> please, because what it'll do is I'll be ticking off. Because after reading your books, you know, I, as I say, I've been following some of the bands back, you know, like, um, oh, what was the, the, the band that was um, pre the Eagles? Um, Shil- oh, was it Shiloh. Shiloh, yeah. yeah. And I thought, wow, this is extraordinary. I didn't even know this album existed. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that and Long Branch Penny Whistle. You listen Long, to Long Branch, Branch Penny, Penny Whistle. Whistle. You and you hear, you're hearing the Eagles. You're hearing yeah. the early Eagles, Long Branch Penny Whistle. Yeah, Long Branch Penny Whistle were extraordinary, you know. And you could just see, but it was just too early. And I sometimes feel there's an awful lot of these bands were just too early. I mean, yeah. the Cana- like, for instance, with the, the start-up again of the country rock movement. I mean, there was a Canadian band, um, Oh, in the late 1980s, mid to late 1980s in Toronto, Blue, Rod- Blue, Blue Rodeo. Yes, Blue Rodeo. And Blue Rodeo. And they were just, they were brilliant, but they were just too early. Yes, yeah. Well, and also Prairie Oyster came around that same time too. And, and they, were, they were a country rock band from Toronto. Great, great music. But yeah, the timing, it, it's all, always all about timing. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like I, I'm, I'm involved in a documentary about the song Born to be Wild. And, um, you know, between a, it's a co-production between a Canadian company and a German company. And the timing was perfect for that because 1968 was a very violent year. So people didn't want peace and love and wear flowers in your hair stuff from a year before. Born to be Wild could only work in 68. It could never have worked in 67. But would have had the impact if it had not been the seminal tune of Easy Rider as well, you know. But it had already been a hit by then. I had it. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it, it was a oh, hit okay. in six, summer of 68. Easy Rider is 69. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And as you say, John Kay, I was, I always found him terrifying. <laughs> he was so frightening. <laughs> well, you, know he's, you know he's legally blind. That's why he wears the shades. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, right. He, he can't see more than about three feet in front of him. And he's colorblind. He said all his acid trips were in black and white. <laughs> <laughs> now that's bad luck, isn't it? That really was, that begs some certain questions again about the stuff I rise about in terms of perception. So that's interesting. So his acid trips were in black and white. Intriguing. Right, John. Well, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that um, we've gone slightly over, but I really, really enjoy this. I'll contact you in the next couple of days and we'll get that date in. We normally sure. go out on Mondays if that's okay, Monday afternoon, UK time. So about the same time, because I think we scratched the surface and I think we could go on for hours. And I think there will be certain people that will love what we're talking about. And the rest of them will just think they'll turn around and say, oh, nerds or something. I don't know. They'll say, okay, boomer. (laughs) Yeah, boomer. Yeah, that's exactly the term they'll use. Okay, John, thank you very much. That was absolutely extraordinary. Thank you very much. And uh, everybody else, thank you. And everybody else, thank you for for listening. And I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, Take care, everybody. Thank you.